be in Mexico. This is my second time at the at the this city that they lost ideas, which uh, I think is really a wonderful uh, wonderful expression of everything that is not going on in the United States right now in terms of uh, showing uh, our global our global shared common values and, and interests. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'll be glad to take whatever questions you have. Uh, I am the editorial page editor for the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, the largest newspaper in Northern California. I've been in this position for, for 20 years. Uh, before that, I had a, a number of uh, positions uh, all on the news side as both a reporter and a, and a signing editor. Uh, but I have to say, uh, working on the opinion pages is the best job in the newspaper. Uh, you know, I get to have opinions and write my opinions. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, U.S.-Mexico relations loomed extremely large in this last campaign. From the day one, when Donald Trump announced his candidacy and talked about building a wall and talked about the quote-unquote threat from immigration. But I have to tell you, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I think in California generally, uh, there's really an appreciation for the value of immigration and what it's meant not only for our economy and the Mexico economy, but also the cultural richness that, that we get by having the, the relationship that we have with Mexico. I will say this, no matter what happens in Washington, I don't think that relationship is going to be weakened in, in California. Our new newly elected U.S. Senator Kamala Harris uh, talked to a group of um, uh, immigrants in Los Angeles recently and said, we've got your back. And I think, I think we're going to see that kind of resistance if Trump really tries to inflict some of the policies that, that he talked about during the campaign. It's one thing to campaign, it's another to uh, take the, uh, the reins of the presidency. Um, just one, one quick thought I have, and then I'll, I'll take your questions. Because one of the things that I've heard asked of me here in Mexico is do you think Donald Trump is going to be govern, governing differently than he campaigned? And I think the, the, first, the first sign that we can really have of, of which direction he's going is, it, is the appointments that he's made. And I have to say, I'm not optimistic. The signs are not good. Uh, it, it, if you look at some of the people that he's appointed, I would use a phrase that, that he used uh, during the, one of his debates with Hillary Clinton. I think he's hanging out with some bad hombres. Uh, you know, he, his appointment for Attorney General, which is the number one law officer in the United States, Jeff Sessions, somebody who's been vehemently opposed to immigration reform, uh, that's not a good sign. His appointment for his chief White House strategist, Stephen Bannon, is somebody who's made a lot of, you know, uh, been associated with a, a website that has a lot of bigoted commentary. Uh, so I, in the near term, I'm not optimistic because I think uh, Donald Trump's first inclination is to validate the, the wishes of the people who elected him. But let me have an optimistic note. I don't think it's going to last. I think if he continues with the sort of divisive uh, rhetoric, the sort of uh, alienated, alienating policies, not only with Mexico, but the rest of the world, I think he's going to get a lot of resistance in the United States. But that would be glad to take any questions you have. Have I answered all your questions? <laughs> There were, there were two speakers that spoke in English during that talk, you and another. And uh, it was not you, but the topic comes up a lot in the press in the United States as well as Mexico, is that uh, Mexicans are found in the kitchen, in the gardens, and uh, building a wall, and they'll be deported after building a wall. And yet you and I and all of us were in a room packed with Mexicans. I don't, think, I don't think a single one of them knows how to mix cement or to lay a brick or uh, do the things that Mexicans are always talked about doing in the United States. You are an editorial page writer and shape opinion. What can we do to change the opinion of Mexicans 
that are in the United States. And I mean, yesterday we had a, a cancer specialist, a Mexican, Mexican cancer specialist, uh, speaking to us here in the uh, room. And uh, it's not a country of dishwashers, uh, crop pickers, and uh, gardeners. It's a country of uh, skilled people. And uh, how do we get that across? Well, I think uh, certainly my job in the media is to help educate people on help educate our audience, which is predominantly Americans, obviously, on what is really going on. And, and first of all, as much as Donald Trump uh, postured about you know migration and this flood of immigrants that we have, I mean the reality is immigration from Mexico to the United States has been at net zero for a number of years. Uh, so I think that's one of the important things to get across. I think the other thing that uh, maybe is, is not widely understood in the, in the U.S., although as a journalist I'm doing my, my utmost to make sure people are aware of it, is, is the remarkable growth and evolution of the economy here, that, that the U.S. Is, and, and Mexico are, are, are really interdependent on each other in, in, in ways far more nuanced and, and expansive than, as you point out, you know, the, the perception. Uh, if you, if you, the interesting thing is if you look at, at where Donald Trump was strongest, it tended to be where immigrants were fewest. In, the, in California, he received somewhere south of 30% of the vote. Uh, and those are people who, uh, you know, California obviously has a great deal of immigration, uh, and I think people are aware of it, but if you look at so many of those states where people see immigrants as somehow a threat, and, and, and I think uh, the interesting thing is, if you, I was just talking to, uh, you know, Jose uh, Antonio me, and, and he was pointing out you know, that, that right now, you know, there, there are winners and losers in NAFTA on both sides of the border. And, and so I think, uh, as I said in the presentation, I think the American business community is going to rebel, and they have a lot of influence on Capitol Hill if, if Trump really tries to push a lot of these anti-free trade policies, protectionist policies. Good question. Yeah, what's your opinion about the Mexican government? I, I, are they doing enough for the Mexicans? Uh, the, uh, I mean, the Mexicans in the USA? In terms of the Mexican government's response? Yes. Well, I, I would say this. That would be a question I would actually, uh, you know, uh, ask all of you. You know a lot more than I do. But I do think there is a recognition that, uh, you know, uh, that your president has done a lot in terms of, uh, uh, at least early on in his administration, uh, of implementing some reforms. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, the perception of Mexico generally in terms of the government, in terms of your systems, still challenged in many ways, uh, but improving would be my perception. Thank you. Uh, futurology might be far from, from journalism and from politics as well. But uh, there is a movement which is called Connexit. Uh, to what extent do you believe it would be a trend? Uh, we've seen that in, in Europe, a Brexit, which now is falling apart somehow. But it was announced years before. So what future would you define for, for this movement for Brexit? You've obviously been paying attention to what's going on over the border. I would say this about Alexa. It is 100% soothing to uh, Californians who are really frustrated with the election outcome and how it went against so many values that we hold dear. I think it has zero chance of succeeding. Uh, I don't think there's any real serious effort in, in California to uh, secede from the United States. If we were to try, and I don't even think it's going to get that far, ultimately we would have to 
you know, have a constitutional amendment which would start with the Republican Congress. And even though they may not like the way we vote, uh, I think they value our economy, which if it were a nation would be somewhere around plus or minus six in the world. So uh, I think it's, it's a good way of venting. I see the hashtag CalExit a lot on my Twitter, uh, but I don't think it's gonna happen. And I don't think it will even get past step one. Thank you. Which real role do you think the media play, play in this election? And based on that, are you surprised by the results? I am, I am very surprised by the results. Uh, I think the media, uh, I don't think we so much missed the Trump phenomenon, is, is because we certainly reported on it in every aspect, not only the outrageous things he was saying, the, the lies and distortions that he was spreading, uh, but the fact that a lot of people were responding to it, the media certainly reported that. Here, here is my overall sense of of the media's response to Trump in, in the United States is he benefited greatly by being so crazy early on. Uh, in my office, I always have CNN on in the background uh, while I'm working that way. If there's a major story somewhere in the country, I'm aware of it. And I have to tell you, early on, even in the Republican primary, they would cut away from regular programming to show his speeches, unedited, uninterrupted, in full, because they knew he was probably gonna say something stupid, and, and that would give them, some, the commentators, something to talk about. So that definitely lifted him. He had far more coverage than any of the, uh, any of the Republican candidates, I mean, by exponentially more. In fact, in the primary season, he had more media coverage than Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, the two Democrats combined. Uh, and ultimately, uh, ultimately, if you look at US newspaper endorsements, he, Donald Trump, this is the first time this has happened in modern history, where not a single major American newspaper endorsed Donald Trump. Some, many who, and some like the Arizona Republic, which had endorsed Republicans throughout their history, endorsed Hillary Clinton. There were some papers, like in Detroit, where they endorsed Gary Johnson, the Libertarian. Some newspapers, didn't, Republican newspapers, didn't endorse anybody at all. The largest uh, newspaper to endorse Donald Trump was the Las Vegas Review Journal, which is owned by Sheldon Adelson, who is a big Republican contributor. I mean, normally, when you would look at that, you would say, wow, this guy has no chance. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of introspection uh, in the media about how we how we covered the election. But I have to say this: I think the result was a rejection not only of Hillary Clinton, but maybe even more so, it was a rejection of a lot of American institutions, including the media, frankly. You know, we lost a lot of ground in terms of credibility when you have a major candidate who is going out day in and day out, he's mocking the press pool, saying they're liars, they're horrible people, I and mean, those were the kinds of words he was using. Uh, they're disgusting, they're scum, those are Donald Trump's real words. And for his, and for his uh, supporters, they embraced that because they didn't want to believe what we were writing, and, and I think it worked to his advantage. It's getting, so we in the mainstream media in the United States, are, we have some work to do to repair our standing, and especially when you have all these fake news sites that we're getting a lot of bits. It's really a, it's a, it's a challenging time for American media. Good question. Thank you. Hi, uh, what's your, in your opinion, what's the real risk uh, for the American industry if Trump applied the um, military policies that kind of... I'm sorry, I missed your question. What's the real risk if uh, Trump applied the military uh, policies that he announced in his campaign? Well, I think if he does try to implement a lot of the policies he has, 
uh, he's going to get pushed back. And, and you know, we have a number of things coming up uh, that are really going to give us a sense of how serious he is. I mean, I talked about his appointments, but one of the uh, one of the things that I think we're going to have to look at is President Obama did a lot by executive order uh, on, on policies that are diametrically opposed by uh, the Trump campaign. Things like uh, the Dreamers, you know, the, the young people who have been grown up in America, they, they came uh, at a very young age and now have a chance to go to college. Will Trump go after that? That'll be, you know, a, a telling thing. Certainly on climate, uh, the President Obama did a lot by executive order, orders that uh, Donald Trump, if he's still in climate, can, can rip up on day one. I mean, I worry, uh, I worry about the U.S. economy, particularly uh, in California, uh, global trade, trade with Mexico is so important to us. Um, and as much as anything, I, I worry about the way not only Americans treat the rest of the world, and the rest of the world regards us, which I think we made some advances during Obama, but also the way we, we interact with each other as Americans. I think this is really, there were, there were divisions before this election, they've been torn wide open during this election. It's going to be a precarious time for the United States. Uh, from Channel One Los Angeles, um, I have a question for you that it's very interesting we want to hear your opinion. Um, what do you think about the visit of Donald Trump to, to President Pena? Because there was a lot of controversy here, this side, saying that he betrays, you know, the Mexican people. But um, in the sense that now he's the president, what, what is your opinion of that? The second one, sorry, the second one is, um, they just appointed that probably uh, Mitt Romney is going to be in his cabinet. And you were saying you were worried about that. And it was a former runner for president as well. So those two things that you can please help. Well, let me answer the second question first. I'm actually not worried about Mitt Romney being in, in uh, Trump's cabinet because I think in many ways he would be a stabilizing influence, both uh, in policy and in tone. Uh, I think the big question is whether Mitt Romney will want to be in Donald Trump's cabinet considering all the things that he said about him you know, during the campaign. Uh, are you referring to the, pre the visit that, that Trump had in Mexico during the campaign? I have to say, uh, I think that was a miscalculation by President Pena to, to have that meeting uh, with a candidate who was so openly hostile uh, toward, toward Mexico and, and also who was so fast and loose, loose with the truth. Don't you think, no matter what was said in that meeting, that Donald Trump was going to come out and say whatever he thought would help him politically? Uh, I think probably doing that meeting was, was a mistake. Um, and, and it allowed Donald Trump to get some post-meeting spin that was undeserved. And from what I understand, it did not play well uh, with the voters down here. Uh, I think there will be new opportunities to rebuild the relationships once Donald Trump goes into office. I don't know that that will happen right away, but as I said in the uh, session there, I've been a little bit struck since the election at Donald Trump's facial expressions. Uh, not only on election night, I would, I would say uh, his face had a little bit of humility which is something I never saw during the campaign. And then when he met with uh, uh, President Obama in the Oval Office uh, that Thursday, I would say Donald Trump came across as respectful, which is a word I would never use with him during the campaign. So I think there is some hope that U.S.-Mexico relations can, can move forward, uh, but it, I think I think Donald Trump has some repairing to do because, uh, I mean, the idea that you could somehow get a sovereign nation to do something that they don't want to do uh, that is really disrespectful to its people is just insane. And, and also, 
Uh, there's a real question about how effective a wall would be. Uh, I think that's one of those campaign pledges that uh, four years from now we're going to look back and it will be kind of like President Obama saying he was going to close Guantanamo Bay. Much easier said than done. I think Donald Trump will have some good excuses for not having that wall built, but I don't see that wall going up anytime soon. Certainly not in the next four years. Um, hi. In your opinion, what could be the steps in the new process to make political groups or international groups uh, politics? Sorry. The next step. Um, in when you when you want to want to make a new politics uh, in the new with new government. Uh, what would be the steps? The steps for uh, of the change. The steps for change for Trump. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the first thing he's going to have to do, uh, uh, which he has not necessarily done yet, is is build some relations with with Capitol Hill, and and really have an alliance who will do what what he wants to do. Uh, and I think that's going to take time because. The thing is, Donald Trump does not go into the White House with a huge mandate. He, he goes in with a, a, a significant supply of fervent supporters, but he really doesn't have a mandate from the American people. More people voted for Hillary Clinton than voted for Donald Trump. We just happen to have this crazy system called Electoral College in the United States, which I actually write about in my Sunday column that, that should be online now, that, that amplifies the influence of a few states. Here we have a, a country of more than 300 million people, and, and our election is basically decided by six to eight battleground states. Uh, so Donald Trump, it, he's not going to go in with a lot of Republicans fearful of him because a lot of them did not necessarily run for him with for him. They don't necessarily owe their um, election to him. I might say when Ronald Reagan ran in, in 1980 and there were a lot of Republicans who would not have won were not for Ronald Reagan. Uh, Donald Trump doesn't have that same kind of coattails and, and mandate. So I think that his first step is going to, he's going to have to build the support base bigger than it is now if he wants to get any of these policies done. And he's also going to have to do something that we didn't see any sign up during the campaign. He's going to have to compromise. I mean, that is the reality. There is no way all these, all these promises that you heard during the campaign are going to go into effect without him compromising. What, what about the, his menace to the Muslims? That he's going to make a, a database of Muslims and uh, prevent them from coming to America? In, in terms of the wall or? No, in terms of, the, of Islam, of the Muslims. Oh, 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 Muslims, yes. Uh, I think even if he wants to do that, uh, he's going to run into constitutional problems. Uh, the, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution not only guarantees uh, freedom of the press, thankfully, because I hate to think of it then with this guy is present, but also guarantees freedom of religion. And I think uh, to separate people on the basis of their religious belief, or even to ask people what their religious belief is when they uh, apply for a passport to the United States, apply for a visa, is, uh, is basically an un-American. Uh, and I think no matter how determined he is to do that, uh, it's not gonna happen. Because I think it will be challenged constitutionally, and I think it will be thrown out constitutionally. And, and I think there is, a, there is no shortage of groups in the United States that, that would take him on with that. Having said that, there may be further screening than what we've seen. Uh, but it won't be the it won't be a matter of you mark that you're a Muslim and you can't get in the United States. I just do not see that happening, even if he wants wants to. Good Thank question. you.
Well, thank you so much for your questions. I'm really honored that, uh, that you had questions for me. Well, well, one more. Has, uh, you have access to the backstage, and uh, we don't. But some of the people here have good connections, I don't. And uh, you were at a panel during the U.S. election. But it seems to me that it was also the first political debate for the Mexican election of 2018 with the governor and the secretary, both of whom was that talked about in fact? Uh, well, not in front of me. <laughs> no. But uh, it, it were, I, I did not miss that dynamic, which is very interesting. I have to say, it was very, uh, I just found out this morning that I was going to be on the panel. So, I mean, I, and I found out when I got here, that's why I'm dressed so casually. But uh, it, was, it was very interesting. I mean, as far as I can tell, there was not much interaction between the two. Uh, but, I'll tell you what, it makes me a whole lot more interested in the election here now that I've been on the panel with those two. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, your questions and, and your interest, and I hope I helped in some way with your coverage. Thank you.